Hey everybody, welcome back to Woodwork and Wisdom. My name's Colin Way, um, and today it's all about bowl embellishment, um, which is easy for me to say. I've done a couple of um, bowls just to prep, um, and so we're going to look at a few things really. I just wanted this as a um, as a demonstration, more of a um, more to get your your thoughts flowing when it comes to bowl decoration. Um, we all know that you know a lot of the timbers we use are really beautiful. They're lovely, and they don't need any embellishment at all. But it's just to free you up. If you wanted to do something, if you wanted to add color, if you wanted to add some texture, that sort of stuff, it's just to start you on that that thought process um, when it comes to bowlish bowl embellishment. Now, I haven't gone small. I've gone fairly big with um, these bowls, and this first piece is quite an attractive piece of timber, but. I'll show you in a minute the prep that I've, I've started doing for this. Um, there's two things we're going to look at, really. Um, holding your workpiece. So we're going to look at the Pro Mount, which is a professional piece of kit. Um, it's not a cheap piece of kit. It's a considered um, purchase. But for holding bowls, if you're going to do a lot of this embellishment, it's really, really useful because it keeps you at the lathe. So you can literally come off the chuck, put the chuck in the in the mount, put that in the banjo of your lathe, and you're away. So you can decorate nice and easily. We've got loads and loads of cameras set up, so hopefully we'll be able to get every angle. Um, so as well as the the um, the work holding, we're going to look at a carving tool that, um, as a company, we've been selling it for quite a few years. It's a, a power carver, reciprocating power carver, and it just makes the carving process so much easier, especially on mixed grain, which we're going to get through the bowl. And on this particular piece where we're going around the, the, the rim of the bowl, where that grain um, changes, it, it doesn't get impeded like a normal carving chisel might do. Um, so we're going to look at that. And then I'm going to go back to a couple of my favorite products. So the Chromacraft stencils, we're gonna, um, we've done a bit of that last, or no, uh, a few months ago, actually, we've done a bit of the stencils where we were decorating the rims bowls. This time we're just going to do the outside of a, a fairly pale piece of timber and then turn the inside to that finish. So a few things we've got going on. This is really um, intended, or, or I've intended it to um, get you to ask questions. And like I say, to start that thought process going. So lots of things to look at. Um, a lot of the things I'm thinking as we're going as well. So my head's spinning at the same time. I've already started um, uh, uh, working on this piece um, and started thinking differently than I was um, earlier. Now, in terms of um, inspiration, you find that you're going to get inspiration from all all over the place anything you do tv programs you watch places you visit things you uh, talk about with people magazines you read all of those sorts of things even just looking in, into nature and, and grass and sunrises sunsets trees you know all those sorts of things you'll get different forms of inspiration uh, and of course from the people um that you look at in, in the wood turning world so if you buy wood turning magazines if you watch videos if you know all of those sorts of things demonstrators those sorts of things you'll get inspiration from um and this is exactly what we get when we ask you to send in um your ideas for demonstrations we've had a lot recently um, one that springs to mind, Jenny, she was asking if we could do something on finishing. We're going to put that in into June. Um, this, in fact, embellishing was one of your uh, suggestions. You know the old ones, you know, the penguins, the the um, the boxes, the pencil cranes, all those sorts of things. They're your suggestions. So um, they help to inspire us as well. So keep them coming in. So on to what we've got. We have got quite a lot to do today, um, and I'm sure this is going to spur quite a few questions as well. So what I've done, this piece is a piece of sycamore. It's a piece of spalted sycamore, and there's quite a lot going in. There's, and timber spalt in different ways. Sycamore tends to be a little bit more muted than you would get uh, beech, for instance. Beech is probably one of the most um, striking spaltings that, you, that you're going to get. And spalting is just a, a fungus. It's a battleground. Um, the fungus is, is meeting here. So very often you'll find that one side of the black lines are a different color to the other side of the black lines, just the way it is. But that's um, you're not going to get a huge amount of black lines when it comes to sycamore. You, you more often get this mottled effect, so like a marbling, um, which is still quite nice. And, and also a lot of the time on um, sycamore, you'll get like a red spalting, which is quite a nice line as well. It's not, I haven't got any of it on here, but it's quite interesting. So I've done this band around here and I've started just playing with different textures, what we can do. But as well as that, I'm going to add a bit of color to this one as well and see what happens when we break through um, the texture. So um, 
I think what I'll do first, I'll just take the bowl off. We'll look at the carving tool um, that we're going to use, and we'll do a couple of these these little finishes here. Then we'll add a bit of colour. We'll carry on carving, and then we'll do a bit more turning to it, and we'll see what happens. We'll just get see what happens, see what we can discover about um, this texture. We've got some um, questions. Ben's on cameras, by the way. Um, he's going to be doing all the camera trickery and, um, and the questions, so please divert your questions to him, and he'll ask me. Yes, Ben, we've got the first one. Okay, so um, just a quick apology to Cliff. Um, I haven't uploaded the um, the plan for yesterday's um, bowl yet. Uh, I'm j it's just an IT issue for me. I'm not very tech. Um, so a question for you, Colin, from Pete. Um, he's saying that you answered a question about the stay put hose recently. Um, what do you mount the stay put hose in? Um, so the stable hose is mounted in, um, oh, we call it a DES. A dust extraction stand? A dust extraction stand, D-E-S. <laughs> there we are, dust, I've learned something today, dust extraction stand. <laughs> they come in two um, price bands, one all metal, heavy duty, and then the other one um, a little bit more plastic on it. Um, they both do the same job. I don't really see the difference that much. Um, so have a look on it. Um, Dust extraction stand on the Axminster website, and you'll find them. They're basically a tripod, um, and it's just a, a four-inch duct. If I can hold this up a minute. Ugh, it's quite lumpy. There we are. And it's all adjustable sort of thing. One ho A hose on one end to your dust extractor, and then this. Um, Stay put hose. Uh, it's available in meter. Chop it in half so you get two sections, um, and away you go. It it, um, it untwists. It's a spiral basically, so you can untwist it to make it bigger, uh, wind it up to make it smaller. But it's really useful stuff. Um, really, because you know what we're doing, we're we're trying to pinpoint um, our extraction into one small area. If we had the big nozzle, I'm not a fan of the big nozzles because they distribute the the suction all over the place. We need to pinpoint where we wanted to extract from most of the time even on bowls you're sanding into that little area um the dust will vent naturally in a certain position as well so that's why i like that more than ever all right cool so i've just taken the bowl and the moment we're on a, 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 a chuck let's go on for and on a faceplate ring as well i've got another one down there we're just on a normal faceplate but the um the pro mount that i was talking to you about is this piece of kit here um, this one comes with a, a, its own stand and also a carving head. We haven't got the carving head. We've got the, the um, M33 3.5. So the same thread as I've got on my lathe here, which I can now attach all my, my chucks and things to. I'm going to start off, and Ben's going to direct me in a minute just to, to line me up with the camera so you can get the best view. So I'm just literally screwing that onto the pro mount. There we are. So where should I go, Ben? Is that okay for you? There we are. Let's do that. So what I'm going to do, we're just going to look at carving. What it's done for me, it's just made it, made, it's given me a platform that I can stand at comfortably. Whether I'm um, carving like this or whether I'm going to be airbrushing, I can adjust this. You simply, um, when it comes to adjustment, if I undo this one, there we are, I can twist him around, move it wherever I want to. If I also do that, I can do the same thing and just change that orientation. You can put it wherever you want to. So it's really handy. And it, like I say, it just saves my back, saves me from leaning over the, the lathe too, too much. Now, look, we've got two cuts here. If I bring that around so you can see one quite a broad one um, and the other um, more of a V cut. Now, I prefer this one, if I'm honest. But I want to have a look. What I've been thinking about maybe it's quite nice to have a rim full of these type of marks. If we blank them off, you can see you know, what we're going to look like there or alternatively that um, that type of finish. But then I thought, well, what happens then if we do this all around the edge and we then take another couple of cuts? Will we end up with little chevrons in the middle? And I don't know. I haven't tried it yet, so we're going to have a play in a minute. But also, if we add a little bit of colour just to the band, and I was looking at um, Native American Indian um, uh, ceramic pots, so uh, and the, the, the designs that they've used um, or they used to use on their um, their pots. And there was quite bold colours and quite striking. And there was one particular pot that had, it was almost like a feather design, but it, it graduated colour from top to bottom, uh, light to dark. And I thought, if we can do the same thing and then cut through that to give that same effect, that might look quite nice. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to experiment. We're going to play. This is an experimental bowl. 
Um, and so let's let's start experimenting. To start with, let's have a look at the carving tool. We're going to do a couple of these um, cuts. The first cut that we're going to do <coughs> is the broad one. Now, Ben's going to turn the microphone off when I start carving because this is quite loud. And I'll also normally I will have um, a set of ear defenders on when I'm doing this because a bowl of this size resonates quite a lot. So um, I've got my ear defenders next to me. They will go on normally. I'm not going to do it just for this short burst because of the microphone. Yes, Ben. Um, Terry's asking, have you ever used the Arbitec Mini Carver? Uh, the Arbitec Mini? Yes, I have. In fact, I was going to use it today. Ben got it for me to, to use, but I thought, no, let's go for um, – I'm using the Weed Tier one purely because this is the one that I've got at home anyway – um, and the other the other good thing with the wheelchair one is that if you're a turner as opposed to a carver, you can change the heads. So we don't have to just use the reciprocating head for carving. You can use the rotary one if you want to do some some piercing, if you want to do some um, some texturing, those sorts of things. So that's why I've gone for that one. The the um, the carver, the object carver, is a specific carver. That's what it does, and it's exceptional at doing that. Um, but this, the one I'm using is just an all-rounder. Yes, Ben. And Chris is asking, if you burnt the carving marks, what would you finish it with? Um, an oil or a stain? Um, funny you should say that. Um, so this is, again, just playing around yesterday. This is one that I was doing um, doing yesterday. And so what I've done here with, is a similar sort of markings that I've used the carver just uh, around the edge. And then um, I took it outside and scorched the edge with a, a blowtorch. Um, and then oiled it. So I had the lathe running. I then used my uh, little brass brush. Okay, little brass brush um, just to take off all the soft stuff and then a coat of oil all over it to seal that um, that charring in. Okay, so good timely question there. That wasn't prompted at all. Fantastic. So look, there's my weed chair. This is, um, it's not hung up. It's got a little hangy hook. To hang it up from the ceiling, which makes things nice and easy, easy. Um, but it doesn't normally live in here. It's this is Ben's. Um, it normally lives in his room, so it's just hanging there for the moment. I've also got just again makes life easier. I've got a little foot controller. I don't know whether you can see that in that image. If I get it into there, we are. I just see it in the shavings. Um, but a little foot controller that I can control when I want to turn it on and off as I see fit and it's at a comfortable height that's the good thing so if you go to camera one um Ben you can adjust it you know your working height of your lathe is suiting you um as mine is and I can adjust it so I can get right in on top of it I'm not bending my back we've done this before and I've demonstrated to you before where I've had the bowl here and I'm crawling all over the bowl to get to uh, all over the lathe to get to the bowl um and this just makes things a little bit easier so foot control beneath me, and we're just going to literally do some carving. I won't do too many because of the noise. If you turn my microphone off. There we are, everybody. Sorry, we're going to jiggle with these microphones around. So that was a broad cutter. Um, let me get the tool in place there. Look, so there you can see that uh, that chisel tip. It's quite a broad curve on there. Sweep, I don't know. I would probably say it's around about a number six sweep on there if it was measured at all. But I'm going to change that one now to a V cutter and just do that other marking before we add some color and swap over. Let's just have a look. move him around to the other cuts so these cuts as you can see there they're more well they are literally that they're a v so same thing again if we can just have the mic off just for
There we are. So what we've got there is two completely different looks. I just bring him around to just to show you. So you can see the V's here and we've got the, um, the open ones. What I want to do now, we could completely go around and, and cover that. That would be quite nice uh, around the rim of the bowl. But let's get some color on there and then do the same thing just to see. And then I'm dead keen. I'm excited just to see what happens if I do another turning around there. What would happen? Um, it's always worth doing you know, a few things like this, a few little experiments from time to time, just so you, you can progress your turning a little bit further. We're always doing it. A lot of the time, they're happy accidents. Um, but this one is intentional experimenting. Yes, Ben. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, what's the vibration like on a tool, um, on the hands with that tool, please, from Mark? Oh, I was getting very little there, uh, vibration at all. Um, I know where you're coming from. It's a lot less than any normal power tool. Um, you, you barely notice it uh, at all, honestly. Um, it is such a, a high rate that uh, I wasn't getting anything. And then Paul keeps his lathe in the shed and um, the bed has developed some surface rust. Um, what do you use to remove it before applying a coat of wax or oil to protect it? Well, you can just use basic abrasive if you want to. Um, we have um, a particular material called Garaflex that we use in the workshops here. Um, it's a rubberized um, abrasive. We use that to go over it. But what you'll find is you need to get that oil into the the, the uh, into the metal. Um, the moisture will be absorbed into the metal a, a little bit, and so it, it's quite difficult sometimes. You usually have to apply over the course of a couple of days if it's got really, um, you know, really a, a lot of rust on there. So get really coarse, get it down to the steel, then your Abronet, uh, sorry, your, your um, Garaflex, then Comedia oil or your lathe wax and just work it in and um, and that should do it. And then um, Chris is just going back to the burning on the bowls. Um, did you do that while it was still in the chuck? No, no. Um, took it outside. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, we've got some quite uh, sensitive fire detectors here to um, detect heat and smoke. So I have to take everything outside. Um, because they're picked out areas, you can they'll catch a lot quicker than a broad surface so you can literally go around them and then a little bit of sanding on those broad surfaces to get your definition back to your timber so yeah off the lathe um just be a little bit careful we've got tinder underneath our lathe um and it only takes a little bit to to drop down um onto that for, for horrible things to happen right then so a little bit of turning we're all right for the minute ben lovely a little bit of turning and this isn't a project that you're gonna have to, you're gonna be able to come back to if we want a nice clean line here we've got to pretty much get at it straight away we leave it overnight things start moving so just bear that in mind so a little bit of airbrush now i'm using uh the chromacraft wood dyes so they're, they're really nice um a selection of colors there i've got i'm going to use the, it's the indian colors like the um the the um <laughs> the turquoise the yellows sort of orangey colors just to recreate what i've seen on um, on my searches um but yeah we're just going to graduate them slowly so i'm going to start with a yellow and then we're going to work through to um work for it our way through to the blue so um i've got my little compressor down beside me you won't see it but it's a little airbrush compressor nice and quiet Uh, we need a yellow first, not that one. I'm not overly worried if I get too much on the surrounding areas. However, I'm going to try and keep it ju just the band. And that means going nice and close. Fading out. Now, you'll get a lot of people ask how you can um, stop bleed. What I've done here is I've sanded down to a really, really fine grit, so around about 600, and that almost creates a barrier. It's all hard for the dye to penetrate unless you put it on really thick. Um, so sanding beside this rim would be quite easy if we wanted to sand out some of the overspill because it wouldn't have penetrated that far. So nice and fine. You shouldn't get too much penetration there. Uh, we'll go for an orange next. Yeah. 
Then we we'll go for red. Incidentally, this is um, when in about two weeks' time we've got a double demo. I'm doing two sessions, one after the other, on the Wednesday and the Thursday, I think it is. And that's going to be um, looking at the Nick Agar Viking Sunset Bowl and the kit associated with it and how you can make your own Viking Sunset Bowl. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go online and put Nick Agar Viking Sunset Bowl in. You'll soon see one of the most iconic bowls or bowl designs that you'll see out there at the moment. And we sell a kit for you to make your own, so... A little bit deeper with that red. And then I'm going to end up with one of those nice blues. Wacky at the moment. All right, let's turn our presser off. All right, so there we are. Now, at the moment, we've just got color. What I want to do is strike through that color with a bit of carving. So we're going to go back to our pro mount, airbrush paint, or uh, sorry, airbrush dye. Applying with an airbrush means that the, the, the dye is now dry. So we can create straight away. And I'll adjust for the cameras in a second. Let's get him on there. Go back to our carver. All right there, Ben. Right, so remember where we were. Let me just bring the bowl around to you. So we were doing these, these lines here. Let's see what happens if we cut through this painted area now. And then we'll put it back on the lathe and we'll turn another section. See what happens. This is... This is as much new to me as it is to you, so we're playing. Don't get a chance to play. We're all so busy a lot of the time making stuff. What time do we get to experiment? So here we go. Well, let's take some nice cuts. Just do a few more, and then we'll put them back on the lathe. Now, look, you can see from what I'm doing, I'm not taking any care at all. All I'm doing is just, you know, taking a cut uh, not worrying about spacing or anything like that. And we're getting some quite nice effects. I'm starting to like the look of that. I may um, 
I may finish this bowl. We'll see. See how we get on. If if I wanted to just take another cut off some of these, it's not. It's fairly easy. That it's a nice controllable tool because it's such uh, moving at such a high rate. You don't um, get any stubbornness. But it's a lovely clean cut. This is what I was trying to say earlier. Where you think you've got the grain running through here, we've got side grain here and potential for end grain here, but it cuts through all equally. It's quite a nice um, a nice tool to work that way. So what I want to do now is just want to put it back on the lathe and just take um, another couple of cuts. So I'm going to take three in total, actually. I'm going to take an end cut and then a middle cut and then a further end cut at the top. Just to see. It might ruin it completely, but unless we try, we will never know. So let's have a look. Just move my carver out of the way, pro mount out of the way, and then we'll just go with uh, a fairly quick cut just to see. Lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. A relatively quick speed here. You're going to get some funny noises when you do this because obviously there's lots of serrations there already. And be fairly clean. I'm going to use the skew. Not just any skew, of course. You know what skew we're using here. I'm going to use the signature skew just to do... just to scrape some small Vs in. That's going to stop. I'm going to stop and have a look just to see. Because I'm, re I'm really curious to see what it's going to look like. Right. We're, we've got some things happening. I'm quite pleased. One thing I'm picking up on already is I need to make sure that I start my cuts in the same position each time. Because I've got some nice little dots here, but then it, they fade away as I come further around. So a little bit more of attention to where we start and finish. Right, let's do one right in the middle. Stop and have a look. And we can, you know, really mix up the amount of... Oh, yeah, that's worked really lovely. I'm, really, I'm going to try and get you really close into this or bring the, the, um, the camera close. <laughs> Let me just do a little bit of a deeper cut because that's really worked. And once you know something worked, then you can start expanding on that idea. You can take it. Well, who knows where you're going to take it when that happens. What it's done for us, I'll bring the Unless we can get in there really close. I'll bring this up to the top top camera. It's given us those little chevrons, but several other shapes have sort of crept out from there. You've got a really nice sort of beaded shape as well. That's the large ones, the large marks, and then you can see the smaller little beads coming from the smaller V cuts. A different effect again where we've got no, or where we've carved the ink away. But then what an interesting sort of little experiment. I think to start with, I was less enamored with the big cuts. I was happier with the small ones. But now since cutting through it, actually those big cuts work better. Imagine that around fully around the width of the, um, the, the bowl, you'll get these little square sections appear. So I'm quite pleased with that. We've made some progress. Yes, Ben. So we've got a few questions here, Colwyn. Um, the the one with um, we were talking about um, the scorching of the outside of taking it out the chuck. 
Um, mm. It's a question about rechucking it, about getting it back into the, the ch seat, seated back in the chuck properly. So this one was on a faceplate ring. Okay, so all I need to do if I'm on a faceplate ring, okay, I want to go outside and I want to do a little bit of scorching. So let's take him outside. Okay, do what I need to do. Come back, metal on metal, just rechuck all day long. Don't need to worry um, about rechucking because it's metal on metal. Um, and faceplate rings. Uh, I think they're invaluable, and you've seen me use them numerous times. I've got one on the push plate. I've got another one on the sanding disc. They're just easy and um, relatively inexpensive accessories to add to the C jaws to your um, to your Axminster chucks. So, yeah, that's my um, way out of that one. Or alternatively, if you're using a normal faceplate, don't take it off the faceplate. Unscrew it. Take it out. Do what you need to do. Put it back on again. And then Jenny's asking, if she just wanted to have a go with the scorching or the burning, could you use a Cook's um, blowtorch, mm. the little mini one? Yeah, um, we have we have a couple in here, actually. I'm using one at home all of the time. They're absolutely. The only thing I would say, Jenny, they don't develop the heat that you get from a regular, what I would say, a plumber's um, torch. Um, let me just hang there, look at that beautiful bar while I just go and grab something to show you a second. Um, the, the regular plumber's torch, they do develop quite a lot of heat. So um, it doesn't take much, literally a, a cup or a second or half a second even over um, what you're doing to um, create that scorch. The, the little cooks ones, they just take a little bit more. So that's the sort of thing that I use. Um, it's just, you know, it's a, a click and it's a light, but that's about as much as I can do in here. We're already nervous at just doing that, but yeah, it's just a little bit longer, a little bit, um, it's more of a, it's like using a, a fine pen as opposed to a big felt tip. All right. And then, um, Fuller's asking how often does the reciprocating chisel need touching up the sharpening? Um, <laughs> The minute it goes, it starts to dull. Um, you know what I normally say, keep things sharp rather than let them go blunt before you resharpen. I would say the same with that. <coughs> um, on this one, uh, Philly, you've got, again, if I can hold it up, we've very, very polished, um, a very, very polished back surface. So they are honed um, on a polishing mop uh, with honing soap once we've got that initial cut. The reason that we take the heel away, if I can get the focus on there, there we are. If the reason we take the heel away, it slides through the timber much easier, like a very fine carving um, chisel, and um, polish the back so you hit little friction at all. All right. So I didn't really answer your question there. Um, keep it sharp. So I would say if I've done a bit of this, I'll probably halfway through this, I might just go and touch it up on the, the, on the honing wheel um, just to make sure it stays nice and sharp. This is relatively softened timber, though. Um, if you're using harder, drier timbers, then, yeah, then you have to sharpen more often. And then Fuller's asked, well, he's saying um, a texturing tool might look quite good on there. Two seconds. I'm going <laughs> to run away again. Just you know, keep focusing on that bowl. So what I said, um, Fuller, in, in a few weeks' time, we're going to be doing one of Nick Agar's famous bowls. I've been talking to Nick fairly um constantly about this and he's given me some tips to show you um this is a something that he came up with whilst he was on the norwegian wood turning cruise in fact so what we're going to be doing two weeks time in for two sessions they will be recorded sessions there's a lot to get in um, and then there'll be a um, an, an edited version um, going out on youtube for you it's just a how to so you're on about texturing uh, fuller so yes the, now this isn't finished yet there's a lot to do on this one and that one just needs another coat as well but we're going to end up with one of his um one of those signature pieces but look at the texturing that we've got on there absolutely agree with what you're saying texturing will be fantastic um and again if i can get nice and close the different textures on there using those tools that jason was uh, demonstrating not so long ago the, the crown texturing tools um to get different effects and we're going to use a series of punches as well to get the same sort of thing. 
then dies, and then chroma gilts over the top to highlight the low points, which you don't normally do. You're normally highlighting high points. Um, so we're going to look and experiment with those. So that's coming up in uh, in a fortnight's time for um, for a, a couple of sessions. So yeah, dead right. Texturing tools are perfect, um, as well as your color. There's so much to do. There's so many techniques and things that we can be playing with. You know, just a basic bowl is fine. But look, at the world of woodsering just delivers so much. Yes. And then um, one from Norman here. He's asking, um, it's, it's a little bit off piece. Um, what's the plastic sheet you use when casting a bowl blank? So I guess it's resin. Um, when casting a bowl blank. So I tend to use in resin, in the world of resin, I use a lot of Fomex. That's Fomex. These boards here is what the sign writers use to make boards. Um, it's a, a, a nice bendy material. You can get that right the way down to two millimeters thick. And, um, and of course, it'll peel off. Especially if you use anti, um, you know, mold release tape and mold release sprays, that's quite good. Just be a little bit careful sometimes. Um, if you're putting a lot of um, a lot of weight in it, it will bow. Um, so you may have to stabilize with timber as well. Um, and interestingly, I've just done three casts um, last week. I've used timber for that, but I've capped it with the Fomex. Um, so just to you know, just to give it strength. Really, I've, I've used timber, but capping with Fomex. And then um, Mark's asking, would they be the same punches you used in um, Plymouth? Yes. For a demonstration. He said they were great. Yes, Mark. Yeah, exactly the same thing. But uh, a little bit more time um, than I had down there. I will actually finish this piece. Um, so, yeah. Finger, well, fingers crossed I'll finish this piece. Um, okay. So let's just divert away from that. We'll go back to the stencils now. And I started, um, well, I prepped up earlier. Get rid of some of these pieces of kit um, another bowl just another idea for you another way of using the stencils i've got two types of stencils in the chromacraft range now so we're talking a uh, chromacraft and they're available as peel off stencils which are these stickers basically okay oh, where am i sorry ben peel off stencils okay which are these and then your infill stencils so that's your detail so there are your infill. We're just going to play around with both of these at, at the moment. Um, I've chosen the red maple leaf, um, and they're both in the peel-off and the infill. Um, they complement each other, so you can add detail to what you've already done. Um, I prepped my bowl blank, so I've done the back side of the piece. And this, what I want to do with this one is have, um, have the leaves surrounding the entire back face of the bowl but have the front face of the bowl completely clean and white. Um, and the, we're using a transparent dye, remember, so we can see the grain through it. So we're not covering timber up. We're just picking out, we're decorating, we're embellishing exactly what the demo is supposed to be. We're embellishing. What I've got on the back of this one is a faceplate, exactly what we were talking about earlier. So all I need to do is pop my pro mount on. We're going to finish this bowl, and then we can do the reveal as to what it looks like so but the same same thing with the pro mount here and i'll get again get ben to just direct me in a moment the face plate again because it fits this lathe it's the same thread so all i need to do is in fact what i'll do make it easy because i've got those pieces of blanking material on if i just take that out try and get everything on camera where i can screw that in there we are. Pop that back in, tighten everything up. Again, it gives me a stable platform working in front of me rather than me coming around to the lathe and bending over and contorting myself. I can move the piece around. So let's start right up here with this one and work our way around. We're going to go forest green. Obviously, it's a leaf, so forest green is the natural colour for me. And I'm going to spray quite heavily around the outside edge, but then infill the rest of it. We are going to add other colours. This is a, a dual action 
suction feed airbrush. And suction feed just means that we're taking the ink or the color from the little jar underneath here. Do you want to fire some questions whilst I'm doing this, Ben? Yeah, please. Um, got a couple here. <clears throat> First one from Chris. He's um, interested in the um, the Viking Bowl, the Nick Agar Viking Bowl. Mm. Um, do you need an airbrush and compressor to apply the colour? He doesn't have either. Could it be applied manually? Not really. No. The reason being the blend. What What an airbrush gives you is a blend, a very soft blend. So you will get hard edges from any color if you put it on without. And, and with the, the the signature bowl, the, the sunset bowl, you've got three colors on there. You've got the yellow, the red, and the orange, uh, or as well as the black, of course. Um, so you need that bleed. Now, you don't have to spend a fortune on airbrushes. You can get some relatively inexpensive airbrushes, and I'm talking around about the 20 to 30 pound mark. You don't have to go compressor. You can go compressed air. So like uh, that would be a tin um, of, of air. And if you go for a starter set, a lot of the time you'll have one of those um, compressed air um, uh, aerosol cans in there as well. Um, or you can use your own air. So you can get airbrushes where you blow through. So uh, atomizer type um, airbrush as well. So those are your options. But yeah, to do that, you need that nice blend. Um, if you want to recreate one of Nick's, yes. And then uh, Mark's asking, what PSI or bar do you do you use um, on your airbrush? Um, a mixture, really. General airbrushing, I'm working around about 35, um, which sounds a lot. But if you want to go um, for something like the thicker uh, effect um, paints, you need to go with a bigger nozzle um, and a slightly higher uh, PSI. With ones with glitter and things like that, and you just need a slightly... Um, uh, large amount of pressure there but yeah 25 to 35 psi works for these types of things they're quite a, a, a weak or a, a liquid solution there we are that's the green yes ben and then um robert's asking could he just swing the lathe head around to do this you can swing the lathe head around bear in mind you're dead flat again so but but yeah absolutely no problem this can give me my just gives me my different tilts a little bit of orange i haven't got brown so i'm going to use a little bit of orange just around the edge just to get a, a few of the highlights not spending too much time i'm going to add another color in a minute well, in fact we're adding another couple of colors we're going to go for a, a black and a yellow yellow at the end And see how quickly I'm doing this. I'm not messing around. You take as much time as you want to when you come to do it. Is that all alright in camera, Ben? Yeah. Looks good, doesn't it? Cool. Uh, black next, because what I want to do is go for... In fact, yeah, black. Where's my black? Not grey. Black. Because what I want to do is just pick out some of the details. So look what we've got here. So these are the stencils that match our leaves. So if I bring that one up there, you can see it's perfect match for that one. And that one is a perfect match for that one, for instance. Okay, so we can pick out the highlights. Yes, Ben. Um, so we've got a question here. Uh, let me, sorry, I've just lost it. Um, oh, the arbor on the um, pro mount there, Colin, is that tapered or straight? Uh, straight. That was from Wayne. Just using the air to flatten the stencil down. Not spending too much. I don't want a harsh line, you see. And we are going to go over these as well again in a minute. But just to blend them out a little bit. Cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, Gary's asking, could he use leather um, leather tooling stamps to decorate it? Absolutely, yeah. I got the the ones that I use are, are they're 
I think they're, it's either leather or jewellery stamps. See, it's just giving a hint of those veins. We're, again, I'll get them close up to the camera in a minute for you. But we just just let the air push the, the stencil down. There we are. Now, instead of just leaving that, just to just highlight them with a by coming away, coming away from the piece a little bit just to blend out those harsh lines take some of that sharpness out There we are. Now a little bit of colour. We're going to go with a nice yellow just to just to rich and enrich that leaf. It just makes things ping a little bit more, that yellow. A bit of sunshine. why I like airbrushing so much because it's so quick the drying time is just literally instant you can move straight on with the next color and makes using these templates really easy now let's stand that up a little bit for you so you can see we'll get the camera nice and close in a minute as well I'm just going to, before you turn over to it, um, I'm just going to bring this really close. There we are. The camera three, if you would, uh, Bernard, a little bit. So at the moment, it's quite a mess. We can start, start doing the nice, uh, this is, it's like unwrapping a Christmas present. This is, you know what's going to be underneath. You know it's going to be lovely. And all your hard work pays off. It, and it, to start with, the preparation is, is very much key. If you miss an area, you will have it painted. Okay, so just bear that in mind. And then it, you have to go back and sand a little bit away just to get rid of your marks. So let's get rid of all this masking tape. Use low stick, low grab masking tape. You don't want to start peeling off the timber. It's surprising. Um, you know, some tapes will, will do that. They'll take away some of the fibers. There we are. Do you mind if I just ask you a couple of questions while you're you peeling that off, Carl? Carry Cole? on, yes. So uh, one here from Jenny. Uh, for the airbrushing, do you try to um, your color ideas on paper before you go onto the wood? She'd hate to muck it up after taking the time to turn the bow. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> no, I absolutely um, all for that. Do you know, and the best way of, of just testing your colors is paper. Play with um, with the paper. I'll show you. Don't bend. Don't let me forget. When we finish in a minute, I'll get one of my easels up and I'll just put it in place and show you how easy it is on a lathe to create that easel. Look, you can see what I've already done down here. So let's start taking away. I'm going to get my little contact sheet over to put these stencils back on. Because don't forget, these stencils are... Uh, reusable after you just use them once so just remember the order that you've put them on on <coughs> so just nice and careful take your take your time when removing and also take your time when you're putting them back on your, your piece of paper here
Um, Frederick's asking, could you use a um, apply a finishing lacquer using an airbrush as opposed to an aerosol can? You can. You can. And there are some lacquers better than others. So, again, if we look at um, Chromacraft, and, and it's something that I'll be doing for um, the Viking Sunset Bar, we're going to be using a urethane lacquer over the top. So not a urethane lacquer, um, uh, an acrylic lacquer over the top as a seal. Um, but you can also use urethane lacquers as well. And then Keith's asking, is it possible to clean the stencils so that you could, um, be, so that they could be used multiple times? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So what I'll do with these is I'll put them down on this, this little sheet and then wipe them over with meths. And that takes all of that color away. Um, I've done that frequently on these particular ones. And the same with the infill stencils as well. They just wipe clean. And it's great to hear from Terry. He's been watching some videos. He's produced a load of pens. So that's <laughs> good stuff. Well done, Terry. You're on. Remind us when you're on, Terry. I think it's Mondays, isn't it? No, it's not. It's Tuesdays. Or is it today? Because we were watching the other day, actually. Tell everybody you're on and put a link up to your your channel. There we are. I'm just just being careful. You know, these are like I say. We've already said that they're reusable. They won't be if you break them. All right, so just take your time. Take the biggie off. I'll do that properly in a minute. One more. There we go. There's our very quickly finished bowl. Oh, cleaning with mess. Look, you can see on these infill stencils, these are due a clean. I'm going to clean one for you in a minute. It's just to show. You. I also want to show you the um, the easel. But let me take that off and show you. Um, if maybe we can go to uh, camera number two there, Ben. That would be grand. There's our little leaf bowl. Um, I purposely went quite heavy with the design on the back because I want to leave the front clear. All right, so nothing on the front. Um, that'll be uh, acrylic lacquer over the top of that when that's fully dry. So it's well, it's dry now. It just needs to cure um, another hour, and then we can go over the top of that. And that's quite a pleasing piece. That one, I'm quite happy with that. Didn't take a lot of effort either. You saw what I done there. Um, this side of the bowl was the new ones. That was what I prepped up for you before you came um, came on. All right. So there we are. Right. Put that to one side. Ben's going to ask some questions. I'm just going to go and get a few other bits of kit to show you before we disappear. Far away, Ben. Was the wood... Sorry, this is from, from Brian. Was the wood sealed in any way to help stop the bleeding? No, I just sanded to 600 grit, Brian. So because I sanded so fine, it creates almost... Um, I wouldn't say it's an impenetrable um, barrier. It means that it's harder for the stain to soak in. Bear that in mind if you want to put, if you want to dye pieces to then sand back, um, bear that in mind that you won't be able, the, the stain won't penetrate too far if you sand too fine. So if you want to go for, say you're picking out ripple and things like that, just sand to, I would say, probably about a 240, put your layer on, then sand back, keep going like that, otherwise you're not going to get that penetration. And Fuller's asking, how many different types of stencils are available? Ooh. Ones we carry, I think we carry about 10 
different um no sorry about six seven different types of infill stencil about 10 different types of peel off stencil chromecraft do do a lot more we haven't taken i don't think we've taken everything but we've taken most of it if you know what i mean have a look on the website um they're all there if you put infill stencil um on peel off stencil or chromacraft you'll get the whole range up um and it's just quick just easy um i've only ever owned one set um and i just keep reusing and reusing so it's not like you have to worry about oh once i've used this once i've got to go and buy another set it doesn't happen you don't need to do that just be careful with them use them over and over and over again this is just methylated spirits i'll put it on that white background oh sorry You can see how it comes off. Let's do that other little black one there. Look. All right, so they clean off really, really easily. And you're good to go again. All right, so that was the cleaning. Dead simple to clean. The same with the peel-off stencils. Do the same thing with those, um, and they're clean easily. Jenny, I wanted to show you about practicing with an easel. I just use a piece of scrap plywood. Um, what's the best one? All I'm going to do with the bed of the lathe here, if you pop that in there, make sure that with your chuck, you've turned the power off. So turn the power off right there. There we are, and I have a really nice easel to work at. You can work from this side, you can work here. It's nicely tilted back for me, um, but it's just slotted into my chuck. Before you do that, turn the power off, disconnect your lathe, okay? Don't don't blame me for, for, for um, easels flying all over the room. You must do that first, safety first every time. It's just in the slot of the chuck, um, and that then I can um, sellotape a couple of A4 pieces or an A3 piece to that board and just... Be comfortable again it's a, a nice easel to, to play with all right um, and just scrap paper there we are any more questions ben before we move let me just get both bowls or both back sides of bowls in today's ideas i suppose we haven't actually physically finished anything but we've got some good ideas um and some good discussion. That's what we're about, getting some good discuss discussion going. So uh, if you have any questions, you know where we are. Um, write in email, Woodworking Wisdom. We will do our best to answer them. Um, we're going to be back. What's this today? Thursday. We're going to be back next Tuesday. Um, we're going to do some Easter flowers. That was, again, I can't remember who asked to do um, flowers, but it was one of your suggestions. We're going to do some Easter flowers. Um, and then we're moving into, it's too far in advance for me to remember what we're going to be doing. Ben, what are you doing next week? I, it's um, Scrabble Day coming up, isn't it? Oh, so we've Scrab got Scrabble. So. We've had a few international days. We've had Pencil Day. We've had Penguin Day. Apparently next week there's an international Scrabble Day, which we're going to mark as well. And then obviously the week after we've got the Viking Sunset Bowls again. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you for, for dropping by. Um, and thanks for all the questions as well. Engagement is what, really helps us with these demonstrations mm -hmm. it's really useful to us and keep the suggestions coming in as well so until next time thank you very much and um don't forget if you like it thumbs up share and subscribe see you next time bye bye <laughs>